right. Can everybody hear me up there? Can everybody hear me up there? All right. So uh, last time we talked about um, Turing and the halting problem. And we said that the uh, number of algorithms, the set of algorithms is countable. Right? You can enumerate the algorithms by lexicographic order. Once you enumerate them by size, there's only so many algorithms or programs or codes of any given size. And then within size by lexicographic order, so you can enumerate everything, number them, and therefore the set of um, algorithms is countable. On the other hand, the set of uh, functions is not countable. And we showed that using diagonalization. Right? The previous proof was by dovetailing. So using diagonalization, you can show the set of uh, Boolean functions is not countable, and therefore some Boolean functions have no algorithm to compute them. And that was a revelation. We, we, didn't, know, we didn't know that. We thought every function that you can precisely state, you can compute somehow, one way or another, and that's, that's wrong. So that's one of Turing's greatest contributions. And then, uh, because there's not enough programs and too many functions, some functions must not have programs to compute them, but that doesn't give you a particular function. It just shows you that some are not computable. In fact, an uncountable number is not computable. An uncountable infinity is not computable at all. But one that's specifically not computable is the halting problem. And the halting problem, we said, is the problem of given a program and an input, whether that program halts on that input or not. Simple, right? Uh, well, it turns out it's impossible to solve algorithmically. And that's the simplest question you can ask about a piece of code or an algorithm is whether it ever halts. Never mind what it does or if it does its job correctly. Right? So uh, we also mentioned that the issue of halting is not because of the size of the program that's the issue. Some very short programs can encapsulate very large, uh, complicated mathematical theorems that's been open for centuries. Yeah, question? Um, can you raise the volume of the microphone, please? OK. Is this better? Louder? Is this good? Good? OK. So uh, very short programs, 10 or 20 lines of code, can be equivalent, in terms of their halting or non-halting, to arbitrary mathematical conjectures that have been open for centuries, like Goldmark conjecture and Fermat's last theorem and so on. So it's not about the size, right? And uh, we then gave a proof that the halting problem is undecidable. We assumed there was an algorithm to solve the halting problem, and then we embedded it in a larger piece of code that does the opposite of what it does. If that piece of code halts and says yes on an input program and its string, the output um, is observed by the encapsulating code, and it does the opposite. It goes into an infinite loop deliberately. Okay? Otherwise, if the subroutine supposedly solves a halting problem, says, says no, it doesn't halt, the encapsulating code says, OK, I will halt deliberately and stop. So this gives a contradiction, because if you feed this program t to itself, it will halt if and only if t will not halt. So that's a contradiction. That's sort of where we stopped last time, less than in, you know, three minutes what we've done the last time. Any questions so far? So that's, that's what the halting problem proof looks like. It's, it's not long, but it's subtle. Okay? And it's um, using non-existence argument that's based on diagonalization. It is kind of a diagonalization in disguise. So in practice, when do we want to feed a program to itself like we did in this proof? Is there something strange about feeding a program to itself? Right? There's cases in practice where you actually want to do this and you do do that. Can anybody think of any? Yeah. Compilers. compilers, right? So compilers, why would a compiler want to compile itself? I mean, that's, that's the next question. So what's, uh, what's the deal there? If you want to build an optim optimizing compiler, that, that's the next, say, newest, coolest, uh, fastest, um, say, C compiler, a C++ compiler. You can write it in C++ and use the old C compiler to compile the new compiler, and the new compiled code will be faster more efficient and more optimizing in the code that it produces when it compiles. But then you want to take that compiled code and compile the source code again using the new compiled code. That's when you feed the compiler to itself to get better, more optimizing compiler version 
and you can still write the new compiler in the language of your old compiler, namely the language that it actually compiles. So there's nothing strange to write a C++ compiler in C++, just make sure it compiles itself twice. Once by the old compiler, and once itself by the new compiler. How many understand this bootstrapping strategy? Okay. So you can actually do this in real life, and people do that. So there's nothing odd about feeding a piece of code to itself. Remember, codes are just strings, <laughs> just like the strings themselves. Right? Bottom line is that infinite, infinite loops are very hard to detect. In fact, impossible to detect in general. That's not to say that you can't do it specifically for very simple cases. Right? Um, and remember, at the beginning of the course, we showed this generalized numbers, and we said that there are real numbers that are not finitely describable. And there are finitely describable real numbers that are not computable using an algorithm. Now we're in a position we can prove these theorems. Okay, let's do the first. So why are some real numbers not finitely describable? Um, because to be finitely describable, you have to have a finite description. That's a string, right? Quote, unquote, and the description in between, whether it's a mathematical formula, you give all the digits or some algorithm to produce digits, like in the case of pi. Those are all perfectly finitely describable. Pi square root of 2, e, 5, and 7, and minus 2 and a half. These are all finitely describable numbers. I just described them to you. But the number of descriptions, number of strings, finite strings, is, is it countable or uncountable? How many say it's countable? How many say uncountable? Countable strings. Yes. So there's only a countable set of descriptions but there's an uncountable set of real numbers. So some real numbers do not have descriptions to describe them, right? And if you ask me to give you an example of one of those, I'll be in trouble because I couldn't fi finitely describe it to you and, you know, in this hour-long lecture or at any other time, right? There's not even a billion character-long description or Google-long description of such undescribable real numbers. But doesn't mean they don't exist. They certainly exist. We just can't describe them in finite terms. Algorithmic, formulaic, English description, uh, using an equation, doesn't matter. Or a picture, they're just not describable finitely, no matter what. How many understand that? Okay, any questions about that? This is subtle. This is unexpected. We didn't realize that as a species. Okay, next one. Some finitely describable real numbers are not computable. There are numbers you can describe finitely. I'm about to give you an example. But there's no algorithm to produce those digits. So it's not like pi, where there's a certainly an algorithm, or e, or square root of 2, where there's plenty of algorithms to produce digits of these numbers, which are perfectly finitely describable. This, this number, which I'm about to present, will be finitely describable, but there is no algorithm that produces digits, which is kind of strange. Again, we didn't know such numbers existed. That was one of the results of uh, Turing's paper from his 1936 paper, which we're about to discuss in more detail. Okay, so here is such a number. Take zero point and then have these digits, which I'm calling H1, H2, H3, and make them solutions to the halting problem. So make H sub I one if and only if program P halts on input i, where p and i represent as integers. Now we can number the programs, right? Number the programs with numbers. So when I say program number 37, we all know what we're talking about. When I say program number Google and 1, we all know which program that is, right? Because we already said programs can be numbered. They can be enumerated. They're countable. So these numbers, p and i, now are the integers representing the programs. Not, not no longer the strings, but just the integers. But it's the same thing. It's a mapping between program strings and integers that we use to count these programs with over here using dovetails, right? So input strings, the same thing. You can number them. So represent a program as an integer and an input as an integer. Take 2 to the p, 3 to the i, and make that equal to this digit here. And h sub i, this index, is equal to 1 if and only if program p holds on input i, and it's equal to 0 otherwise. So these digits here represent program input pairs encoded as powers of 2 and 3 multiplied together. And so all the solutions for the halting problem are in these digits of this real number that I'm specifying here. These are all zeros and ones, these ages. So these ages are all zeros and ones representing which pairs halt and which pairs don't halt of programs and, integer, uh, programs and, and input strings. Okay? How many understand this encoding scheme? 
All right, you want to ask me some questions? Because only about half of you are raising your hand. So let me ask you a question then. So why, why am I saying two to the P, three to the I? I can represent a pair, but why not say um, just P times I? That will represent P and I, right? There are multiple yeah, it's got to be a unique representation. So from this product here, I have to uniquely be able to decipher the P and the I without any ambiguity. So if I say P times I, I don't know, there's, there's many pairs of P and I that will equal 360, for example. And I don't know which is which, so it's got to be unique. So this is based on the unique factorization principle of integers, right? Which is also known as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, has a name. It just means that you can uniquely factor integers into prime factors in only one way. Okay, so that's a real number, and not only that, it's a real number between zero and one. How, how many can see that? It's why is it between zero and one? Why isn't it more than three? Simple question. Because there's the zero, there's the decimal point, there's a bunch of digits, right? So I'm, I'm encoding it in binary. It doesn't even have to be binary. It could be a real number in decimal, too. Then it'll be between uh, point, you know, point zero and, 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 and one ninth, right? Point one, 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 right? It'll be between zero and a ninth if it was encoded in decimal, if you think about it. But let's just say it's encoded in binary for simplicity, so it's between zero and one, yeah. Is it possible for h to be equal to zero? Good question. Who wants to answer that? What's the definition? So for h, for little h to be zero, all these big h, h's, all these big red h's will have to be zero also. Which means, yeah, which means no program will hold on no input. Right? So, uh, you know, it, so, so if no program holds on any input, so, so this is like the ith program and the ith input. I, I didn't put these subscripts in there, but they should be there. You know, two to the p sub i and three to the i sub i. So it's like the, the ith p and the, the ith capital I, the ith input. So the ith program and the ith input. I should really add those subscripts in there. But if, if little h was zero, that means no program halted on no input. Uh, is that true, that no program holds on any input? Well, it's, no, it's not true, so it's not going to be zero. There's going to be a lot of ones in there. But it's also going to be a lot of zeros, because a lot of programs do hold on a lot of inputs. But also a lot of programs don't hold on a lot of inputs also, besides from the first assertion. So there'll be lots of zeros and ones here. Uh, so this is a finite description. I just described it finitely, what this number little h is. Right? How many realize I just described it to you precisely? You know what each and every digit in it means, and why it's zero or why it's one. How many understand that? It's complete, precise, mathematically correct description. End of story, period, I'm done. So I described it to you finitely. But this number is not computable using an algorithm. If there was a subroutine that produces digits of this number, this number little h, so like a subroutine that produces digits of pi or e or the square root of two or any, any other number, I can exploit this subroutine into solving the halting problem for me. How will I do that? Some program and some input will walk into the room, and here is how I would solve that halting problem instance if I have a subroutine to produce these digits. I'm going to fire up the subroutine that, that produces these digits and just wait for more and more digits to be produced. And when the correct digit is produced, I will know the answer to that program and that input that walked in the door, because eventually, all the digits will be produced. Every digit, however long down the chain of digits down here, will be produced eventually by this supposed algorithm that, that prints out this number. Even though the algorithm runs forever and there's an infinite number of digits, just like pi, there's perfectly good algorithms that will print digits of pi without ending and all the digits will be correct, right? You can do that, you know, it's not trivial. You have to have some formula for pi and compute with high precision, more and more digits, but you can do this algorithmically. Nothing stops you from doing it given enough time more and more digits will be produced. If that was true for this little number h, when the right digit is produced after a long enough wait, it'll give you the solution to every instance of the halting problem that might walk in the door, and I can use that to just 
predict the answer to that halting problem instance, and I will be now an algorithm that solves the halting problem using that as a subroutine. The subroutine produces digits of little h. How many get this trick? Okay, it's a transformation. I reduced the problem of halting into the problem of producing digits for little h, and algorithmically. And so if I can produce digits of little h, I'm solving the halting problem by waiting long enough and running that as a subroutine. And that's my halting problem algorithm. But we already know there's no halting problem algorithm whatsoever. So there can't be an algorithm to produce digits of h either, of little h. Ain't gonna happen, it doesn't exist. It's not a matter of difficulty or hardness or R&D or cleverness or omniscience or omnipotence, it ain't there. There is no algorithm for it. Otherwise there'd be an algorithm for the halting problem wrapped around that subroutine with this extra bit of code that I mentioned. How many understand this argument? It's subtle. It's not usually lengthy, but it's, it's subtle. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yes, why, why those numbers two and three? So, so I can decipher from the product the actual factors, P and I. Because if I tell you the product is 360, what, what are the two factors that multiplied out to 360? You don't know, it could be 180 times two, or 90 times four, right? Or 120 times three, you have no way of knowing. But if, but if I say, it was a bunch of twos multiplied by a bunch of threes, specifically, even 360, you know how many twos and threes multiplied out to 360, but of course it has also fives in it, so. So for example, if I say six is of this form, six is little i, what is p and what is big I here if the product of the powers is six? One and one, right? And if I say it's 36, it's two and two. And if I say it's 12, it's two and one, right, the powers. So from the, because it's two and three, and these are both prime numbers, if I give you the product, you can decipher by doing divisions what the actual powers were of those primes. That's why I'm using two and three. I could have used five and seven. I could have used 11 and 13, but they better be prime. Otherwise, I couldn't uniquely decipher the powers from the actual product yet. Yeah, so you have to prove it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so first of all, not finitely describable things cannot be described finitely. So it's, 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 it's a little hard to reason about them using arbitrary means, right? But you can still reason about them some other ways. So for example, if I say there's a language that's not describable, what I just said doesn't describe it, it just points to it. I can say, call that language L. L is an undescribable language of a certain type, right? That doesn't describe L, because it's like saying something is a number. It doesn't tell you what it is, it just tells you what type of thing it is. So I can say L is an undescribable language. Take the complement of L. Is the complement of L describable? If L is undescribable language, by the way, let me not be presumptuous. Uh, are there any un undescribable languages? How many say yeah? How many say no? Let me back up even further. What is a language? I, I, again, I just don't want to be presumptuous after a long weekend that you remember the definition even. But what is a language? A language is a what? Set of strings. Set of strings. So it's a subset of sigma star. Sigma star is all strings. How many subsets of sigma star, first of all, is sigma star countable? Yeah, it's infinite, it's countable. How many subsets are there, countable or uncountable of sigma star? Uncountable. uncountable, good. So there's an uncountable number of subsets of sigma star, each one is a language, a set of strings. So there's an uncountable number of languages, okay? Uh, the number of descriptions, of finite descriptions, those are just the strings. Not every string is a description, but every description is a string, so the number of descriptions is countable, but you just said the number of languages is not countable. That immediately shows that the number of languages that are not describable is not just infinite, 
They don't just exist by bunches, by infinite quantities, but by uncountable infinity. So an uncountable number of languages is undescribable. Finitely. Finitely undescribable. How many understand this argument? This just follows from all the results we've already seen. So not only some languages are undescribable, not only many languages are undescribable, which is true, an infinity of languages are undescribable, that's also true, but an uncountable infinity of languages are undescribable, finitely, which is true again. So it's pretty bleak. Most things are not describable finitely. Only a few things are. Of course, there's plenty of interesting things that are finitely describable, like the set of words in, Eng in English. That's a perfectly finite set, finitely describable. If nothing else, put them all between commas and put braces on the ends, and there's English for you. And it's even a finite set, it's not even infinite. There's about a million words in English, including technical terms. OK, having said all that, and I'll, I'll get back to you, having said all that, I can say, let L be one of those undescribable languages we just talked about. Take the complement of L. Is the complement of L undescribable or describable finitely? How many say the complement of L is also finitely undescribable? How many say it's finitely describable, the complement of L? Okay. And I have votes either way. So, so which one is it? I mean, why would it be describable finitely or not? If the complement of L was finitely describable, then what? Then you could finally describe L. Exactly. Good. So you'd be finally describing, describing L by saying it's the complement of that. It's the complement of the complement. Right? So the complement of L is not finally describable either. How many understand that? Good. Next question. What's the union of both of these languages, L and the complement of L? They're both undescribable. What is their union? Sigma star. Sigma star. That one is perfectly fine, and it's perfectly describable. So here's two undescribable languages, L and L bar, the complement of L, but their union is perfectly finitely describable. In fact, it's sigma star, exactly sigma star, no more, no less. Very short description, sigma and star. And you know exactly what the union is, even though you don't have no idea what either one is. So back to your question originally, you said, you know, how can you prove things about undescribable things or reason about them? You know, how do you deal with it? Well, we just did. We just proved something about a pair of undescribable language, namely that their union was sigma star. Any questions about this or anything related to undescribable, finitely undescribableness uh, or anything else? Yeah. So Of course. Sigma star, let me describe it for you finitely. It's a set of all strings, period. All finite strings. So you say that the union of all undescribable languages is also the Of course. The union of all undescribable languages is what? Sigma star again. So, so. <laughs> exactly. So just because the union is something very well behaved doesn't mean that the components that made up the union are, are easy or well behaved or easy to describe or, 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 or simple. I mean, it happens with real numbers too, right? I mean, pi is a complicated number, right? It's not like, like two. And there's a lot of digits and decimal places, you know, decimal notation it never ends, and it's hard to compute in some complicated formulas, you know, high precision like arithmetic, blah, blah, blah. But same for minus pi, right? Minus pi is also the same difficulty of com computing it and describing it and having formulas for it. But pi plus minus pi, the arithmetic union, if you will, the plus, is what? Zero. And that's a very simple number. So be careful how you reason about these things. You know, strange things can happen, right? And not intuitive things can happen. Uh, you had a question earlier. I didn't forget. Yeah. Um, so I just want to check. So I just say it. Uh, when you say it, what do you mean by it? Uh, I. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, right, there. right here. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can think about it as a function. You know, h sub i is equal to one if i is of this form and it's equal to zero if, 
any other condition. Right? For example, if P is not even a program, but it's Shakespeare's Hamlet, then it'll be a zero. So if P is a program and I is an input and P and I will halt if you ran it, then the corresponding value of H sub I will be one. So in other words, the big H's encode all the solutions to the halting problem in pairs. Program input, program input, pairs. And that's what defines the digits. And that's a perfectly fine, finite description. And I know exactly what the H is defined as, but you still can compute it. Not just you, anybody can compute it. Right? Ancient, omniscient, you know, omnipotent deities can't compute it either, not using algorithms. There is no algorithm to compute this. So that's what we just proved. In other words, we proved that this region is not empty. What is this region? This region are numbers that are reals. They're in, inside the purple region. But its, pro, it's, its numbers are not computable finitely. And that's the blue region. And this red is inside the purple, but outside the blue. And I just showed you an example of one of those red numbers here in this big Venn diagram, set containment diagram. How do you understand what we just did? OK, any questions? Remember, I promised that in this course we will prove theorems like this, and we just did. But up until now, we couldn't have done that because we didn't have the infrastructure, mathematical and intellectual infrastructure, to argue about this. We had to know dovetailing. We had to know diagonalization, countability, uncountability, finite describability, you know, a whole bunch of concepts that we had to lay down, nail down, think about, get comfortable, and now we can prove subtle, amazing, almost counterintuitive things like this. It, 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 these, 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 res these results would be kind of crazy if they weren't true. Right? Because they are true. They're just very counterintuitive, unexpected. So you begin to see the amazing contributions of Cantor and Gödel and then Turing gave to us their gifts to us, to be able to reason like this, about what's doable and what's not doable algorithmically, even in theory, never mind in practice. If it's not possible in theory to compute numbers like this, it's certainly not going to happen in practice. If it's possible in theory, it may still not happen in practice. How many get that? You know, practice is hard. Implementing things is hard. You can, you can have a theoretical super intelligent algorithm, but try to implement that in practice. You know, The Tesla Corporation is trying to do that right now for automatic driving, and so, so is almost every other corporation on Earth, trying to produce machine learning algorithms, AI-ish algorithms. But in theory, it's certainly possible. How do we know that AI is possible in theory, that, that artificial intelligence is possible in theory, at least? How do we know that? We have proofs that this can happen, actually. I'll give you a hint. This room is full of almost 200 of these proofs right now. Look in the mirror. You know, if, if you want to know if artificial intelligence is possible, just ask yourself if intelligence without the artificial, natural intelligence, is it that possible? Well, if you're not sure, look in the mirror, and you'll see a proof right there. Right? Whatever algorithms are running in our heads are making all of this possible. By all of this, what I mean. Not just me talking to you, you understanding me, but the entire room, the building, the computers in it, those are all outputs of these algorithms or this big intelligent algorithm that's running in our head, however that's implemented. It's implemented not using silicon and transistors. It's more like implemented using proteins, enzymes, DNA molecules, and so on. But still, implementation is not the issue. The issue is that it's possible to have a very clever, intelligent, super algorithm. And now we're trying to implement those in silicon rather than in proteins and DNA and enzymes. Future computers may actually not be silicon. Just like in the past, we had computers that weren't even made of silicon either. They were made of metal and cranks and wood and blocks and, you know, Abacuses, abac is it abacai or abacuses? I'm not sure. But you know, computers can take different implementations. They're still computers, <laughs> nevertheless. Now we're talking about quantum computers. It can be made of you know particles and forces and whatever. And, you know, 
There could be all sorts of interesting implementations. But they're all algorithms, nevertheless, of one form or another. Question? Yes. Yes, true in general. So she's saying a very good point. She's saying if you, if you take an uncountable set, so crack from it a countable subset, the result will still be uncountable. In fact, that's one of the homework questions, I think, or at least implicitly it's there. Why is that true? If you take away an uncountable set, if the result was countable, put, the, put back that countable set into this res result which was supposedly countable, and now you can dovetail between the two and count them. And that's the union again, the original set. But the original set was uncountable. And there's the proof to your question. Very good question. How, how many get that? So, so you can take away in countable infinities as long as you want from an uncountable one. It'll never become countable. It'll remain uncountable. And we just gave a proof. You have to be a little careful. Let me just say a little caveat about this proof. When you take away something, you have to take away only what was there before, not other things. Because when you put it back, those other things will go back in. Right? So if you take away one, five, and a cat away from the integers, and then you put them all back in, you won't get the integers back. You'll get the integers and a cat inside. How many understand this subtle point? OK. So you have to take away their intersection. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. But excellent point. Yeah. More questions? This is subtle stuff. This is counterintuitive things we were talking about here. And by the way, this is a girl type numbering where you can encode multiple things as one thing by using the arithmetic unique factorization of the integers to do the encoding so it's unique back and forth. Yeah. Just to clarify, all things that are computable are describable, correct? Uh, yes. Everything that's computable is describable. That's a theorem, right? I mean, how do, how do you prove what he just said? It's another great point, yeah. Yeah, if, if something is computable, there's an algorithm to compute it, and that algorithm is a description of what, what it is you're talking about. Remember, description can take many forms. Right? A description could be an English sentence, it could be a computer code, it could be a poem, right? It's, as long as it uniquely describes what it is we're talking about, without ambiguity, so that you can reconstruct it for yourself without needing me anymore when you only have a description on your hands. So a piece of code, but de facto, is a description, and it's a finite description. Because a piece of code starts with an open brace and ends with a closed brace, whether it's in C or you know, whatever language it is. A piece of code is always finite description, but a description nevertheless. That doesn't mean it's the only description of that thing, but it's one finite description. This thing has no algorithm to describe it, but it has a finite description, nevertheless. Yeah. Well, an algorithm is a, a, a complete description if you run it and use it to do things with, right? So if I, say, if I say f of x is equal to x squared, that's a complete description of a parabola. How many get that? Now, it's not a parabola. It's a function. But from that function, you can derive however many pieces of points and sections and segments and the entire parabola, if you'd like, right? So, so if I say, if x is 3, what's the y on that parabola? Well, it's 3 squared. So it gives you a method to uniquely and unambiguously and decisively compute every aspect of the object that we're talking about. No ambiguity, no confusion, and you don't need me for it anymore. If I say f of x is x squared, now you're on your own. If, I, if somebody says, what's, what's, what's f of 13, you can compute that without needing me anymore. You don't have to come back to me and say, oh, uh, what, what is f of 13? And I'll say, oh, it's uh, 169. No, you don't need me for that. You can do it yourself from that description, f of x is x squared. So that's a complete, f of x is x squared is a complete description, functional description of a parabola, for example. And I can give you many other examples, right? 
which is the other curves like circles, and, and not just that, but you know how to invert a matrix, how to multiply things, how to uh, produce you know computer graphics. You know, a code is a complete description, just like a function is a complete description, assuming it, there's nothing more to it than that, than the code or the function. But that's a very subtle question. You know, what does it mean to describe something? We can start splitting hairs about semantics about that. You, know, you can even take it further. You can say, you know, what, I what is a curve? What is a function? You know, what, what is a, you know, a, a parabola to begin with? You know, what is a circle? Does a circle even exist in this universe? You know, but that gets into philosophy and semantics. You know. Uh, you know, what is math altogether? What, what, what is five? Never mind circles and ellipses. No, the number two, what is it exactly? Think about that. The number two. I'm not talking about pi or e or you know or all sorts of red herrings about representation and infinite. What's what's two? How many have ever seen the number two in your life? How many have seen a representation of the number two in your life? Okay. How many have actually seen the two itself? Hmm. See? See what I'm saying? Nobody's seen a two. You've seen a little digit that looks like this that represents a two. Or you've seen this that represents a two. Right? But you haven't seen the, the, whether the two even exists is, is a philosophical question. Never mind pi or e or i or quaternions or more complicated things, or matrices, or tensors, vectors. You know. Think about it. You've never seen a two. But that doesn't mean it's not a useful concept. We use it all the time to add up things and keep track of our checking accounts and prices of things and do commerce and keep track of our age, two, three, four. You know, it's nice to be able to count. Whether two exists or not, that's, we can have a long philosophical discussion about that. Uh, no more questions. All right. Um, if you could solve the halting problem, that this will still be a real number, not an algorithm, but there will be an algorithm to produce these digits. How? I will take your subroutine that solves the halting problem, and I will use it to compute whether each digit is a zero or one, and print it out, and then keep going, and now I'm producing digits, just like I would produce digits of pi, or e, or even digits of one. One is 1.0000 forever. That's a simple algorithm to produce digits of one. Lots of zeros. Pi, not so much. This, impossible. But if the whole thing problem was, was solvable algorithmically, then this will be algorithmically producible number also, and it will not be uncomputable, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be one of these things in this region. But if the whole thing problem was solvable algorithmically, does that mean this region now is empty? No. How many get that? How do we know that? How big is this region? I just showed you one thing in it. How big is it really? Is there 12 things in it? Uh, a billion things, a Google things? You already know how many things there are there. How many? Take a wild guess. It's not, a, it's, it's not a Googleplex, it's more than that. How many see it's more than a Googleplex things in there? Yeah, how many then in that region? right there, where this red thing is. It's tiny on this picture, but how, how many things is that in that region? How many real numbers are there then? It's an uncountable. Uncountable, yes, thank you. How many see it's uncountable? How do we know? Somebody prove that. There's an uncountable number of real numbers and there's an number of real numbers. Yeah, it's an uncountable number of real numbers, but only a countable number of algorithms or strings, or descriptions that are finite. So, so there's an uncountable number of numbers right there. I just showed you one. There's an uncountable infinity there, none of which have descriptions or algorithms. None of them are computable. I, I, guess, I guess some of them are finitely describable, others aren't, like here. But both of these, both of these regions are uncountable. Right? There are uncountable number of numbers that have no finite descriptions, and there's an uncountable number uh, of reals that do have uh, finite descriptions but have no algorithms. 
How do I know? Little h it doesn't have an algorithm, even though it has a countable, a finite description. Right? We good on that? How many believe that? We just proved it. H plus one. What properties does it have? How many say it has a finite description? Yeah, it's h plus one, h plus pi, h plus e, h plus pi squared. Those are all finitely described, describable numbers. None of them have algorithms, right? Because if if h plus five had a finite description, you know, had an algorithm to produce digits of it, then, then subtract the five from it, ignore the first five digits of the five, and just keep producing other digits of you know, the number minus h or minus 5, and that'll be just the h. So, so there's plenty of things. I'll just give you one example here, but, you know, add any constant to it. You have another example. Any finitely describable constant, I should be careful to say. Right? All right. Uh, so I'm glad you're asking these questions uh, because it means you're thinking about it. And it's, it's, it's really cool stuff. Counterintuitive, it kind of boggles the mind. It's, it's almost disturbing that these things should be true, except that they are true and mathematically provable on top of being true. Question? So you could add the finitely describable uh, number, which is just negative h. Yeah, so, so minus h will have the same properties as h. It's finitely describable. I just described it. It's minus 0 minus h. But there's no algorithm to produce the digits, but the sum of h and minus h is together 0, and that's perfectly finitely describable, and there's an algorithm to produce it. 0 0.0000 forever. Or just say 0 and stop. That's even simpler. Okay. Nobody says you have to give all the digits if you know that they keep repeating. Right? You just put a little bar over one of them, and, and you're good to go. Well, the complement is, because you take the finite description of the language, and then you say, it's the complement of that, and then walk away. And I know what language you're talking about specifically now, right? Because L is finally describable, and you gave me the description, so that's, we're good on L. And if you say L bar, we're good on that, too. Okay. Question. Oh, yeah. How is it that a subset of a not finitely describable language could be finitely describable? Oh, is it, you, want, you want the other way around? Oh, okay. Then how is it that a subset of a, of a, of an, uh, of a finitely describable language is not finitely describable? Can somebody, it's a good question. Is this a, is this a homework question, by the way? I don't care. We'll answer it right now. <laughs> See, the advantage of coming to class, right? So give me an example of a subset of a finally describable language, but the subset isn't finally describable. That's, that's what you want? It, it could be sigma star for that example, yeah. Yeah, what do you say? Okay, so we've got our sigma star, which is infinitely long. And we've got our little number h, which is infinitely long. And if h is 1, h is 0, then the sigma star for i is not infinitely long. And, or if h of i is 0, sigma star of i is not. Yeah, so, so that's correct, but m more gen let's say more generally even. So sigma star is finitely describable. It's the set of all strings, all finite strings. How many get that? It's a very short finite description. Every language in the universe is a subset of that, including the undescribable ones. So I just gave you not just one example, not just a Googleplex example, I gave you an infinity of examples, and I gave you an uncountable infinity of examples, all at the same time. Right? You can dovetail through sigma star. That's correct. No, no language is bigger than sigma star. The powers of sigma star is a set of all languages. It's not a language. It's a set of languages. You, you know, what's your type errors? You just give a great example of a type error. But it's, they're easy to make. So there's no language that's bigger than sigma star. 
right? There's, there's, no, uh, there's no subsets of integers that are bigger than the integers, right? But you may, so, so, so it, it gets to a subtle point here. So he's sort of alluding to the, to the notion that if something is a subset of something, it's simpler. That's not true. A subset of something is not simpler. It could be much more complicated than the original. Let me give you an example. Take all sets of words, all of them. That's a very simple set. I just described it for you. All sets of, all, all finite sequences of words. Right? The set of all strings with commas in them is, you know, words, and it make, make the words arbitrary. So it's word, comma, word, comma, word, however many words you want separated by commas over the alphabet that's in English alphabet. You can use Chinese alphabet if you want. The alphabet doesn't matter. How many understand the language I'm talking about? It's all strings of words with commas in between. Every string is a bunch of words juxtaposed together with commas to separate them, so I know where a word begins, where it ends. Okay. Very simple set. I just described it in just a few words. And you all know what the set is now. Over the English alphabet, all strings representing words separated by commas. In all combinations, as long as it's finite strings, of course. Let me describe another set. It has only, say, three words in it. That are, it's a subset of what I just described. The first string is Hamlet. Second is Macbeth. And the third is King Lear by Shakespeare. You may have heard of him. That's a s very small, finite subset of that other set. But it's so much more complicated and interesting and subtle and hard to find those strings. And it's not even close. They're all there in this other set. So just because it's a small subset, even a finite set, even three strings, that's it, out of this infinite other set, doesn't make it simpler. It could be a lot more complicated and subtle and meaningful and hard to find and difficult to search for and compose and blah, 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 right? So don't make that, that mistake. It's an easy mistake to make, by the way, that, that, that subset relation implies simplicity or simplerness with respect to the set from whence that subset came. That's not true. So sigma star is a set of all strings. It has everything in it. But that's not a blessing, it's a problem. Because the script for the next Star Wars movie that hasn't been produced yet, you know, the last, thir the third string, the, s the third Star Wars movie in the third trilogy, we haven't seen it yet. It, it hasn't been written down on paper yet, probably it's still evolving. That's a string in Sigma Star, how many get that? So, so, so is tomorrow's newspaper, with all the stock prices of tomorrow, a string in Sigma Star. We just don't know what it is yet, we will tomorrow. These are all strings in Sigma Star. A physics textbook from the 23rd century, including warp drives and time travel and teleportation, assuming a Star Trek kind of universe. You know, that's a string in Sigma Star too. Good luck to you trying to find those strings right now in Sigma Star and nail them down. That's a completely different story. The set contains those three things, you know, the script for Star Wars, tomorrow's newspaper, and a textbook from the 23rd century in physics. I just described a very tiny subset of sigma star. But it's so much more complicated than sigma star that if you found any one of these three thing, things right now, you'd probably become a millionaire you know, overnight, especially about tomorrow's newspaper with all the stock prices. Right. The, the string about the, the textbook from uh, 23rd century in physics, that'll get you a Nobel Prize pretty quickly, right, if you knew what that string is, even though it's in sigma star right now. It's a very tiny subset. These are very important points. You know, if, if you think we're wasting time right now, you're, you're very wrong. You know, it means you're thinking deeply about these things, and you're a lot less to get confused over them as you solve problems and, and wrap your mind more tightly around these concepts. Question? Is 
Uh, you can talk about infinite descriptions if you'd like. It just gets a lot more convoluted, complicated, and harder to reason about, and we won't do that in this course. I mean, this, this course is, will be so abstract enough as it is, just dealing with finite descriptions and finite strings and finite programs. But you can extend that to infinite. Same in graph theory. In graph theory, you have a graph with nodes and edges. How many know about graphs? Yep. Can graph be infinite? How many say yes? It can. You just probably haven't seen those and proved theorems about those and reasoned about those. But graphs can be infinite. Graphs can have an, even an uncountable infinite of nodes and edges, not just a countable infinity of nodes and edges. Yes, or you can do all that. The reals aren't all there is. There's the surreal numbers that contain the reals plus a whole lot of other things that are not contained in the reals. And you could have a whole course about surreal numbers. These things, you know, can yeah, do happen, and they, they exist, and we can reason about them and prove theorems about them, but not in this course. Probably much to <coughs> the relief of most of you, I imagine. But you can, you can read about them on the web. Uh, in fact, the surreal numbers, you can read about them for extra credit in this course by following that pointer to Knuth, Don Knuth's novella about surreal numbers. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing topic. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, but, but they're infinite strings, and in this course, we only talk about finite strings. So it's just like saying, you know, is a real number a number? Yeah, it's a number. It's not a real number. Uh, so don't worry about infinite strings in this course. I mean, I'm telling you they exist, and you can prove things about them and reason about them, and there's a whole theories about them and so on. But let's just stick to finite strings. Believe me, it's going to be fun and cool and challenging and abstract enough just dealing with finite strings. And, and we're already doing this. This is all about finite strings and, uh, you know. Okay, so, so let's, let's keep going. Um, so the computable numbers are finitely describable because an algorithm is a description. It's one kind of description, right? Right, so let's talk about a little more what the uh, solving, the halting problem do and doesn't do. So what the whole, the whole thing problem proof that we just showed a couple of slides ago, what it does is it tells you there's no algorithm that correctly can tell you if a piece of code holds or doesn't hold in a given input. What it doesn't do is that proof doesn't say it can't be done by a non-algorithmic means, like magic or, or spells or you know miracles or you know, you name it, somebody waving a magic wand. It means that in that black box, there can't be an algorithm or a piece of code or a series of steps. It doesn't say that there's in this, 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 you know, magic, that there can't be magic inside this box that solves the whole thing problem. How? I don't know. I don't have to explain magic to you, right? When elves do weird things in Lord of the Rings, you know, nobody questions it. Right? You know, how did this ring can, can have so much power and blah, blah, blah. Well, that, 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 yeah. We're not saying. We're just saying Frodo must get it and throw it over there and blah, blah, blah. It makes a nice story. But the actual magic is never explained if you think about it. You know, when Harry Potter wears a magic wand and you know, somebody turns into something else, we, we don't have to describe the physics of it or the algorithms of it. And in fact, we can't. So this is what we're saying. There's no algorithm inside the box. There can't be. Okay. So if you allow an incorrect algorithm, or if you allow incorrectness, even on in some instances, again, all bets are off. I have a perfectly accurate clock that tells you the time twice a day perfectly correctly. Right? And in fact, I'll, I'll show you my algorithm to tell you the time perfectly correctly twice a day. Right? You know, here, here's the big hand and here's the little hand or vice versa. It's a clock that stopped. This is not going to run, it's, but it'll still be correct twice a day. How many get that? It'll also be incorrect a bunch of times a day, but now we're allowing in incorrectness, right? So you see, when you allow incorrectness, all bets are off. The trick is to be correct every time. Otherwise, you have a very simple algorithm for everything. Give me an algorithm for the halting problem that's allowed to be incorrect an infinite number of times, even though it must be correct an infinite number of times also. Yeah. The, the algorithm is look at the program, look at the input, and just say, yes, it halts. That's it. That's the entire algorithm. Print halts 
quote unquote, and stop. One print statement is the entire algorithm. It'll be correct an infinite number of times, and also incorrect an infinite number of times too. How many get that? It'll be like the stop clock. And that's not hard to do. You just do it with one statement. So the halting problem proof doesn't say that there's no algorithm that's allowed some incorrectness. It says there's no algorithm that must be correct all the time. That one doesn't exist. If you allow some incorrectness, even though you insist on infinite amount of correctness, that's not good enough, and that's simple and trivial, and doesn't do much. Question. Sure, if you use them as subroutines, or stick the code right there in line. But the reason I, I'm harping on single algorithm, even though it can have many components or subroutines, is because if I allowed many algorithms, some, somebody will find the loophole and say, oh, you allow many algorithms? Great. So for program one, I have the algorithm that prints, yes, it holds, and it's correct. For program two, I have another algorithm that prints, no, it doesn't hold, and that's correct too. For program three, you see, and you have an infinite number of algorithms, one per program, and they'll all be correct. End of story. Does that solve the halting problem? No, because there's an infinite number of algorithms now, each one providing one solution to a particular instance, and together they solve the halting problem, but there are an infinite number of algorithms. If I try to combine them, I'll have an infinite program. The, 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 the point is you cannot combine them into a finite program. How many understand, see this point? You know, so, so when I say single, I really mean one algorithm composed of however many parts you want as long as it's a finite number and the whole thing is finite to, at the end. You know, it's one large piece of code. You can parse it however you want into smaller subroutines if you'd like. But that's why I'm saying single. To avoid this special case when people will try to give me one algorithm per instance and that's not going to cut it, basically. Yeah. I could. I could. But if I said finite, so I would say, well, then, you know, how, how many can you have? A hundred, a thousand, a Googleplex? Uh, so, so it's simple to say one. However many you have, you combine them into one, and now we're talking about one again. So, so that, that's, that's a good, it's a, it's a fair point. Okay. Um, if you, so so you, you can't have an infinitely large program or number of algorithms or, you know. Um, so, uh, you cannot allow some instances to not be solved. So let's say, let's say here's an algorithm that is correct an infinite number of times, never incorrect. So how algorithms, I, I'm going to propose an algorithm for the halting problem that's correct an infinite number of times, never incorrect, but sometimes I will just refuse to solve a problem. Sometimes when an instance comes in, I will say no comment. I'm not saying yes or no. How many see I can solve the whole problem very easily that way? Yeah. So what, what would be a solution that has these criteria? Solve one problem and say no problem. Okay, but I've got to be correct an infinite number of times, not just once. So if I solve this one problem, I'll be correct once, but how will I be correct a second time, a third time on other instances? So, if it doesn't hold in the first time, then it's just running. Then it's it. Okay. So, if simulate it, simulate the program on the input, and if it doesn't hold in the first five minutes, stop and say nothing. If it holds in the first five minutes of CPU time or whatever, uh, then stop and correctly report that it halted. Do you have to bound it by five minutes? Could you make it a year, a century, a millennium? trillion years, yeah. Could you just run it and just wait for it to halt? You could, you could do this. If it will halt, you will know, because you, you, the simulator, will halt with it, and then you can correctly report that it halts. But if you, the simulator, see that it doesn't halt, you just have to keep simulating it, if that's your strategy, to keep running it. Either way, you you're either correct or you're not giving an answer by running forever. That's a tacit and implicit passive way of not answering is by refusing 
to answer, right? It's like a cold shoulder, you know. Sometimes somebody asks you something or sends you something and you just don't answer. And that's an implicit no, <laughs> right? Uh, are you interested in going to a movie? Or are you interested in going on a date? No, no. If you get no answer, it's not a yes. Think about it. It's a cold shouldery way of saying no. So the algorithm can cold shouldery refuse to answer by running forever. It's certainly not a positive answer of a yes. It's false. So that means you can solve the yes instances of the halting problem algorithmically very simply. One word. What's your strategy? Solving the yes instances, the instances that do halt. In one word, simulate, or run, or execute, or try. You know. And if it halts, you'll know. If it doesn't halt, you will not know. And there's no way to know that it won't halt because it's undecidable. So if you, some instances, you're allowed to not solve them, either by cold shoulder passively saying nothing. All bets are off. The proof doesn't prove that you can't do that. In fact, you can by simulating it or running it. Okay. What the proof says, you cannot always stop after some finite time and always be correct. That's what the proof says of the halting problem, non-solvability. And if you allow infinite running time, again, the proof doesn't say that if you have infinite running time, maybe some magic can happen and, you know, I don't know how you'll simulate infinite running time using finite running time, even a very long running time, like a Googleplex years. I don't know. And you know, it's not really doable algorithmically, but if you want to say, well, I'll run it for an infinite amount of time, and by then I'll know. And then after the infinite amount of time, I will then know if it holds or doesn't hold. What, what's wrong with that logic, if this was supposedly an algorithm? Run for infinite amount of time, and then, and then you'll know if it holds or doesn't hold after the infinity amount of time expires. What's, what's the, you know, um, fallacy here in this argument? Yeah? But it would be an algorithm. It, it wouldn't be an algorithm, but there's even a more fundamental fallacy here. There isn't an after an infinity. You said runs for infinite amount of time, and after that, you, well, you just said some words that don't make sense. You said after an infinite amount of time. Infinite amount of time, by definition, never ends, and there's no after that. So you'll never get to the good part where it's after that and then you'll know something. That'll never come. That's not an algorithm. It's just words that don't make sense. Some people just use words without thinking or caring whether it makes sense or not. You may know some people like that in your own private lives. I do. Some of them are related to me. But anyway, I, I digress. Uh, just because you say words doesn't imbue them with meaning, uh, just, just so we know, okay? Any other thoughts or questions here? Yeah. There's no reason to say that in the DOE like the simple hypothesis we saw. Like, okay, uh, we could, uh, as long as it's indefinite, we can uh, be a halt. Sure. So, so all sorts of relaxations of the halting problem are solvable. That's what we're saying here, but not the halting problem itself. I can give you another Simple, you know, I can solve all sorts of interesting cases of the halting problem. For example, um, all programs that have no loops in them, I can solve those pretty easily for halting. The answer is always yes, it halts. There is no loops. It can't even not halt if you try. There, there are no loops, and there's no recursion either. So any programs that have no loops will always halt. There's an algorithm. Look for a loop. Ain't there. Say it halts. Stop. I just solved an infinite class of halting problem instances. How many get that? And it's a pretty interesting class because a lot of programs don't have loops. A lot of very interesting programs don't have loops in them. Some transformations, some filters, some, you know, whatever, whatever they do. Um, and I can give you lots of other examples too. That even if there are loops, but the loops have only constant bounds on their on their running lengths, integers, not for i equals one to to to, to j, but only i and for i equals one to a, a million and j equals from one to a billion and so on. All those will hold too. I'm going to get it. So you can have your loops even. Just make sure that the bounds are constant. And so on and so on. So I, it's all sorts of relaxations and special cases that I can solve by the you know, infinitudes if I'd like. But I'm still not solving the general problem, which is what the point is of this proof. So, so we, you know, in this discussion, we're 
saying what the halting problem proof doesn't do after we said what it does. Just so you know from both directions what the limits of these arguments are. And it's a very general argument, a very powerful argument, but it too has some constraints that we assume before we can prove it, believe it's true, and walk away in victory, you need to know what it does and what it doesn't do. So it doesn't talk about oracles, arbitrary entities in the box. Right? We already mentioned magic, and magic spells, or you know, miracles, or whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't address that. We just address algorithms, or codes, or specific mathematical instructions, recipes, and so on. Okay? So Turing proved this in this famous paper, among many other things he did in this paper. One of the most significant papers ever written, 1937, single author. He first defined the notion of computation. Nobody's ever done that before. He was the first to do this. We thought we knew what it means to compute and moved on, but it turns out we didn't until he defined it. And he defined it as a set of states and a transition function. It's a lot like finite automata, as we already discussed, plus a tape, and that's it. It's a very, very simple model of computation. It's still the simplest model that we know. And there's other models that are almost as simple and they're equivalent to this. It's not the only, the only one, of course. And now we call this a Turing machine in his honor. And he also figured out that not only these Turing machines can do arbitrary things, there's a single Turing machine that can do the job of any other Turing machine based on what input you give it. Right? That's not obvious at all. You know, we humans build machines of all kinds, right? You know, if you, you know, when, when you were young, you know, if you wanted to play a video game, you had to go to your Atari or, or Game Boy or Xbox or whatever it was to play the video game. If you wanted to watch TV, you'd have to go to a television set and watch the TV there or a movie. If you wanted to make a phone call, you'd have to pick up a phone and make a call. You know, if you wanted to go shopping, you'd have to go to some department store and so on and so on. If you want to send somebody email, you have to get on your computer and send the email. Now, one machine does it all. What is it called? It's a smartphone, right? So, so there's a great convergence of technology, but Turing saw that in 1937. He said, one machine could do the job of all other machines, bar none, right? One machine to rule them all. And now we call that universal Turing machine. How many have used a universal Turing machine in your own lives? Give me an example of one other than you know, a smartphone. Universal Turing machine type algorithm or program or code. Okay, universal remote. But can you send email out of your universal remote? Yeah. Compiler. How many see a compiler as a universal Turing machine? Really? Only, only five of you? So a compiler is a program that can do the job of any other program based on an input that you give it. If you give it one input, it will produce prime numbers. If you give it another input, it will play World of Warcraft with you, which is not the same as prime numbers. Or you give it another input, it will do arbitrary things. How many, how many can see that? A compiler is a universal Turing machine. Before Turing said that such a thing can exist, we had no idea that, that you can have that. We thought that we'll need lots and lots of machines to do lots and lots of different things. And that's called uh, universality, right? And he came up with the first sort of universal Turing machine and described it in that very same paper. He also proved the understandability of the whole problem, what we just did on the previous slide. He also kind of explicated the church Turing thesis. Everything that's intuitively computable is computable using a Turing machine. And that's, that's a very bold statement. It's such a small, simple model of computation using states, transition functions, and a little blank tape that can be extended, can do anything that we think is doable, either by us or any other way of computing. That's, that's amazing you know, that that would be true. And it's a thesis, because we still have trouble in describing what the human brain does exactly, but machines are doing more and more of what we're doing, including now driving cars and you know, all sorts of amazing things. So that's this paper. If you've never seen this paper, at least once in your life, it's a shame. So here it is. One author, 1936. And he talks about computable numbers, and he talks about certain numbers are not computable, right? And in proving that, you know, he gives 
credit to Alonzo Church, who produced lambda calculus. He shows that his Turing machines are sort of equivalent to lambda calculus, upon which pr functional programming is based, including Lisp, uh, the Lisp language. And he, call, he calls them computing machines. Now we call them Turing machines, but he didn't call them my machines, him being Turing. Uh, we can now call them Turing machines. And he just talks about them as computing machines. And he talks about symbols and alphabets and transition functions, right? I'm just highlighting a few things. They call, you know, it's automatic machines to compute things. And here are some states and you know, transitions defined, right? Now we call them Turing machines. And all that was for the first time in history done in this magnificent seminal paper. It's one of the probably top five most impactful papers ever written. Another one is Einstein's theory of relativity, 1905, that said E's equals MC squared, upon which nuclear weapons are based in World War II. Well, the rest is history, as you know, about nuclear weapons, mass being converted to energy directly, for better or worse. If you do it slowly, you get electricity, you do it quickly, you have to eliminate cities from the map. Um, so another paper is uh, uh, Shannon's information theory paper. But anyway, so he defines Turing machines, he defines um, transition functions right here in this paper for the first time in human history. Right? He defines alphabets, he defines languages. Here's the universal machine that we talked about. This machine here that he defines in the next few pages Look, he says even explicitly, is it, it is possible to invent a single machine which can be used to compute any computable sequence, right? depending on what you input you give it. In, it. in other words, a compiler type construction, right? even though computers didn't even exist in the 1930s, general computers didn't, certainly not compilers, certainly not programming languages, but he still was talking about them, at least in the abstract. Right? So this paper basically gives rise to this great convergence of technology. You know, the, the fact that your iPhone can do so much comes right out of this paper. Right? And he talks about the diagonal process. This is diagonalization right here. It, it, uh, this picture I added, uh, this is your canter kind of smirking, because Turing very heavily uses his diagonalization and transfinite set arithmetic techniques to prove everything he did, just like we did to prove that um, the halting problem is undecidable. So he talks about the church Turing thesis, and how such a universal computer might work. And basically, that's really, talks about subroutines, that programs can call other programs. Now it seems obvious. What, what else would you do but call subroutines? But at the time, it wasn't obvious at all that programs can call other programs and keep compounding and building like that. Right? And that's about the, almost the end of his paper. Right? He talks about uh, the work of Gödel right here. Right? And, uh, and that's about it. Uh, any questions about this? So at least one, it's, and this paper is on the website. If you want to take a deeper dive into this paper and see where most of computer science has started, uh, right there in his 20 or so pages, feel free to do that for extra credit. It's one of the readings if you'd like. All right, see you next time. about uh, like yeah, math being a law or an abstract like yeah. theory. Yeah. I don't know, it was really interesting how you brought up the number two thing. It made me like, because I was like thinking about that a lot.